Hey, you there. You're that scientist chap, a Friedman, Fishman, am I right? Welcome back, you are still watching Mojito's Gaming Bar. This is part 2 of our Half-Life 2 video. You should probably watch part 1 first or you might get confused, but tell you what, I'm not a cop and I'm not your dad. Life is short, if you wanna watch part 2 first, do it. Don't let the man tell you what to do. What you're seeing now is Lost Coast, a tech demo from 2005. The original Half-Life 2 was supposed to have HDR lighting, but they couldn't implement it in time, so they decided to do a little snippet like this to showcase their newfangled technology. There is one point of interest in it though, it's the combined shelling gun in the St. Olga Monastery, which actually reminds me of one point that I forgot to include in the communism parallel. The Combine are shelling all over the place, of course, but they seem to be especially targeting churches and religious buildings, already seen in Ravenholm. Oh, and also did you notice how the word combine is very similar to comrade? Coincidence? I think not. There is a lot of shelling happening in Half-Life 2 and in the sequels, but Lost Coast is the only time where we see the gun that shoots the shells. Before that, I always assumed that the shells were dropped by a plane or maybe a helicopter Nope. And that's about it for Lost Coast. I have it because everyone who bought Half-Life 2 got Lost Coast for free. At first I thought this was cool, but then I thought, wait, some people had to pay for this? Damn. I uh, hope you like leeches. On to episode 1, which does something very unusual right from the bat. The intro is not seen from the eyes of Gordon Freeman. It is some kind of hallucination style recap that sort of retcons the ending of Half-Life 2. We see some tweaked vortigons, which remind me of this meme, and they save Alex and block the G-Man, and the G-Man's pissed off about it. At least that is my interpretation of the cinematic cutscene. What is exactly going on? Your guess is as good as mine. We'll see about that. I guess we will. Though apart from this scene, the G-Man is totally absent from episode 1. Now quick is a little game. While episode 1 was in development, Valve did some kind of little poll with the players of Half-Life 2 to see which was their favorite character. Because they wanted the most well-liked character in Half-Life 2 to be the first face Gordon sees in episode 1. Now can you guess which character it's gonna be? If your answer was Alex, Barney, Isaac, Eli or Judith, you are wrong. It's coming up, it's coming up, it's coming up, it's dog. She was number two on the poll. I still don't know how we got out of there. The last thing I remember is brain falling. A huge explosion, and then I heard vorticons. This is really a relatable moment because I had so many mornings exactly like that. Alex, where are you? Please, God, tell me you're out of the city. Well, not quite yet. What? The citadel's about to explode, and we are too close to have the time to run away. So we are going inside the citadel to try to delay the unavoidable explosion. And we are not sure how we are going to get in, but Dog has an idea. How exactly is this supposed to help us? What? Wait a minute. Oh no. <laughs> it would not have made sense to start the game in a vehicle, but here they found a way to sneak one in. you have a better suggestion, he is a robot, he's done the math. Do the math. Let's do it, before I change my... Whoa. Well, that was sort of underwhelming and anticlimactic. Good throw, dog! Which is a good thing, mind you, it's not like, oh shit, wait, what? Ah, here's the climax. Free 
roller coaster ride. I guess communism isn't so bad after all. And here's something that absolutely blew my fucking mind the first time I saw it. It's a bit dark, so I decided to turn on my flashlight, and absentmindedly I turned it on in front of Alex without thinking twice about it, because why would I have? And here's what happened. I have to admit, I'm a sucker for this kind of little detail. To me, this is the kind of thing that can prop a good game onto a great game. Realistic graphics are cool and old, but realistic human behavior is so underrated in comparison. I value this kind of attention to detail above most other things. Remind me of some time ago, I was playing Dark Souls 2, another game about elevators. As usual, I came to Majula to level up and upgrade my weapons or some shit, and I saw the Emerald Herald doing this, and in my opinion that was super unexpected and very very welcome, especially since the Emerald Herald is a very somber, austere, all work and no play type of character. Seeing this surprised me in a very good way. Anyway, back to Half-Life 2 Episode 1. Oh my god. Stalkers. Well, maybe not. Well, they shouldn't bother us if we leave them alone. The stalkers, originally seen in Nova Prospect, where they are being made, are gaining more importance here. More on them in a few minutes. Hey, did you notice how in Half-Life 2, despite hearing about the Combine all the time, we never actually meet one face to face? We see a shitload of people who work for the Combine, but we never actually see one Combine. Well, here in the Red Room, that is about to change. There is controversy about this, actually, because it's never explicitly stated what the Combine actually are. I personally believe that they are an alien race, but some people believe they're more like a corporation, and everyone can be a Combine if they want, and um, even if they don't want in some cases. That theory makes sense and it has interesting implications, but personally I prefer seeing them as an alien species, just like the Vortigons. It makes more sense to me. Here they are showcasing their Mind Blast ability, which can confuse and disorient you, but doesn't seem to hurt, or at least not enough to make your HP go down. Whatever that was, it's gone now. Let's get out of here. And here we have the return of the confiscation field, which does the exact same thing as last time, which is nice. Sadly, we also have the return of the bad puzzles. <sighs> Thinking. No, it really wasn't. Are you making fun of me? This orange ambient lighting that's generated by all the fires around really makes the combined architecture pop. Viktor Antonov quit Valve in 2005, but his legacy lives on. Looks like this could be a transport elevator to the core. Ah, an elevator. Now we're really playing Half-Life. <laughs> Must be on the right track. We're really moving now. Alex is really good with guns, mechanics, and science, but her number one skill is stating the obvious. Look out! This one's gonna be hard to repair, huh? Hope Dr. Kleiner was right about this. Well, he said the shit was fucked, and the shit indeed looks fucked. Good thing you know what you're doing. Well, here's your elevator. Elevator, we meet again. Straight up, you notice that things are fishy. The Combine Overwatch is fighting tooth and nail against you, even though the Citadel is collapsing and about to explode and they know it. There's nothing left to protect, there's nothing left to defend. Or is it? We expected a rat fleeing the ship type of situation, and it's pretty much the opposite that's happening? Weird. Here we have an interesting puzzle to solve. We gotta go through this tunnel thing, and there are balls of dark energy that are shooting from four different things. It's kinda like playing DDR, but no matter how good your reflexes are, the dark energy balls are gonna push you backwards. I got stuck there for a little while, and finally I figured out that you have to take the door with you and use it as a shield. Generally the puzzles in Half-Life are garbage, but 
this one is pretty cool. And once again, I'm not sure if we needed a puzzle. I mean, the place is gorgeous. Maybe just let us walk through the corridors. That would have been enough as far as I'm concerned. What's the deal with the combined Overwatch anyway? Like the first time I played Half-Life 2, I didn't even realize that those were human beings. I thought they were humanoid aliens like in Doctor Who. I didn't realize that these are people, even though the game clearly states they are. I, I don't know how I missed that. Actually, I do know how I missed that, because in the game, one of the biggest bugs is dialogue lines that don't trigger, or that trigger at the wrong time where there's gunfire all around and you can understand nothing. That's why I always play with subtitles now. The amount of things I missed when I played without subtitles is just unacceptable, really. While you were in there, I did some poking around on the control data. They were trying to start a chain reaction, all right. But destroying the Citadel is just a side effect. What? Since we took out Brain's reactor, this is the only way they have to send a transmission packet back to wherever they came from. That's an odd choice of moment to be whipping out the DreamWorks face. Important enough that they're willing to sacrifice the whole Citadel to send it off. We need to get it back to my dad and Dr. Kleiner at the outpost right away. I've been pulling down a copy. And she what? does it again. I have a feeling it's bad news for all of us. There's something else. It's Judith. Take a look. I'm fairly sure I've pinned down the location of the project. It's hard to say how much of it might have survived intact or whether there's anything remaining that could compromise our work if it were discovered by the Combine. We'll need to take a close look at it, of course, but I should be able to give a better opinion within a few hours. If the site is where we think it is, then it should be no more than... I'm gonna cut you short. We may have been spotted. She's in Antarctica. Oh, and look at that silly three-legged horse thing. Don't worry, he will be back. She's in serious trouble. What? No, I said Antarctica. Serious trouble? Where are that place? I mean, oh, I get it. She's an American. They don't know jack about geography. Now let's get the hell out of here. And that's when things get knocked into 12th gear. Something tells me they don't want to bring their mail. This lift will take us to a train platform. So we have to take an elevator to get to a train. Yeah, this is Half-Life, all right. Okay, let's stop the jokes for a bit, unretard for a minute, and pay close attention to the scene that is about to unfold. In my opinion, this is one of the most important moments in the whole saga. Well, that was a nice clean getaway. I don't know what's in this copy we made, but they're not thrilled about us having it. You know, all things considered, we're not doing... It's a soccer car. God damn the Combine. This is what happens to you if you resist. Or if you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. God, I hope you don't remember who you were. I pose! This little scene is, in my opinion, very important. On a narrative standpoint, it might be the most important scene in the whole series. One of Half-Life 2's biggest shortcomings, in my opinion, is the disconnect between the environment and the main characters. Pretty much every little background NPC in CD17 really show you how hard they have it. Especially the people that you meet at first in the train station and in the apartments. They all seem really depressed and on the verge of a nervous breakdown. But that really clashes with all the named characters, Barney, Alex, Eli, Isaac, Judith. They're all really, they're cracking jokes, they're smiling all the time, they're having fun. And that is just such a disconnect with the rest of the narrative that he always sat wrong with me. I understand that the point is that they're optimists and full of hope, but still, it's too much in the opposite direction compared to the citizens of C-17. And this little scene here is the first heartfelt moment when we see them actually being affected by the Combine. I think it's pretty clear that the implication is that Alex lost a loved one that was turned into a stalker by the Combine. 
could have been a significant other, family member, friend, and maybe several people actually. I remember that in an early build, maybe it was the beta, Dog knew how to talk in sign language because Alex at some point had a partner who was a deaf person. The idea is that before Alex met Gordon Freeman, she had a crush on someone who was hearing impaired, so she taught Dog have a sign so she could practice. Maybe that's the person who got turned into a stalker. So finally, the characters and the narrative connect. That makes Half-Life 2 Episode 1 very important, in my opinion. The first time I saw this scene, it was a real punch in the gut moment for me. And the second time as well. And the third time as well. And the fourth time, my mind connected the dots. The right man in the wrong place. To relocate to one of our finest familiar incentives. I thought so much of the city. He was about to board the express to Nova Prospect. Nova Prospect. It used to be a high security prison. It's something much worse than that now. in the wrong place at the wrong time nova prospect nova prospect oh so this either shows that the g-man is really masterful at playing people like their chess pieces or this was a fluke and catastrophe was avoided basically by luck anyway back to the game all right Let's see where this train is headed. De facto, it's going nowhere because it almost immediately derails. I'm so bad at using the gravity gun. It's shameful, really. Thank you. You're welcome. Hold up a sec. I gotta, I gotta catch my breath. Okay, well, this might not be as easy as I thought. We're in the same boat as the other evacuees now, on foot to a train station. Let's head for the surface. And so we arrive in a series of mini escort missions where Alex is doing most of the escorting. They progressively ramp up in intensity as there are electric grid issues and in most of the tunnel the power gets cut. So you have to do all the fighting in pitch black darkness with only your flashlight and Alex's muzzle flash as light sources. One interesting detail is that if the battery of your flashlight runs out and you don't turn it back on, Alex starts freaking out because she's afraid of the dark. I think that was a really good move by the writers because they give us this Alex Vance, really strong, really smart, she does science, she shoots guns, she climbs everywhere. I think they tried to push a character that was like too perfect and ended up feeling more like a plastic doll than a real person. So I think it's a really good move given her weaknesses. Now some people might say that Alex Vance is kind of just like an American version of Lara Croft. After all, Lara Croft is a scientist and an athlete and a sharpshooter. But that's not good. That's not a good thing. Lara Croft is definitely the most British video game character ever created. Lara Croft is a very, very British character and Tomb Raider is a very, very British game. And British people always do that shit. Like they turn up all the characters' qualities to 11. For example, Sherlock Holmes, James Bond. Some people may like that. I don't. It's good for a book not good for a video game. If a character has only strengths and no weaknesses, where's the fun in that? But that also brings me to an interesting point that I never realized before. Alex Vance is the only action girl from a mainstream American video game. Seriously, close your eyes and think in your head, video game action girl. I can guarantee that whoever you picture in your head is either from Europe or Japan. I cannot think of a single other action girl from an American video game. Oh, I'm sure there are some in some obscure indie games I never heard of, but in a mainstream kind of famous game? Nope, Alex is the only one I can think of. What the hell is that? Hmm, a combine zombie. That's, that's like a, a, a zombine, right? <laughs> zombine, get it? <laughs> Uh, okay. And here we have one of my favorite music tracks in the whole franchise.
Hell yes, I really love that heavy vibe. And Alex's enthusiasm is really infectious. Great shot! And here we have yet another example of dialogue lines that show up in the subtitles but cannot be heard. This is the plague of episode 1. Oh, and it also doubles as yet another example of Valve's elevator fetish. Kind of uncanny. Don't worry, it's gonna get worse. You got to be kidding. stationed on Earth are now isolated units, stranded. There was once a man who was absolutely obsessed with farm machinery. He had everything, tractors, threshing machines, balers, whatever. But his wife had had enough. She says, if you don't get rid of all of this farm equipment you've got lying around, I'm going to divorce you. So he contemplates this because he's quite fond of his wife, but he's also very fond of his farm equipment. And he goes, right, I'm going to have to sell this. And he sells it all and he's devastated, absolutely devastated. So he goes to the pub and he gets absolutely wasted. When he's in the pub, there are some people smoking in there. And he says to the barman, are people allowed to smoke in here? And the barman says, no, they're not. They just started doing it. And I wish all this smoke would go away. And the man says, leave that to me. So he stands up in the middle of the pub. And he just breathes in and it clears the air, sucks all the smoke up. He says to the barman, that should do it. And the barman says, how on earth did you manage that? And he says, well, it's because I'm an ex-tractor fan. I was hoping we'd get a bit farther before they noticed us again. Okay, looks like I can get that ladder down to you. Let me shoot out the latch. I might be a little rusty with this rifle. <laughs> nope, guess I'm not. That's over. Oh, God. Looks like the reactor's back on track for a meltdown. That transmission's going out after all. Oh! I'd like to find another way around these buildings. But we really don't have time. about 50 combine regulations. What are you still doing here? Everyone should clear out of the city. The combine's not making it easy. We're trying to get enough people together to force our way through to the train station. People are meeting up in a safe house nearby. Can you take us there? You bet. Let's go. This way. Hey, it's me. Open the door. What's the password? I'm not even gonna tell you to shut up. Come on in. And 
And here we have another piece of brilliant writing. Listen to the conversation we're about to eavesdrop on. I hate it. I hate it so much and yet I love it at the same time because I have seen and heard so many conversations exactly like this in real life. It hits really close to home in a bittersweet way. It feels almost too real. I met Odessa Kovic one time. What an idiot. Between you and me, I don't trust those Vortigons. I blame Black Mesa. So much for better living through science. Dr. Kleiner says we can mate now. Not that I needed his permission. What idiot put Kleiner in charge? Sometimes I think everybody's a doctor but me. Everything we do seems to make things worse. This was such a nice neighborhood, too. It used to be safer here. We're sitting ducks in here. Or maybe fish in a barrel. Anyway, it's not good. I hear it's a lot better out in the country. I don't miss Dr. Breen, but I do miss his show. Remember when he had the jugglers on? This is gonna sound crazy, but I kind of miss the Combine. Yeesh. But here's a little surprise to sweeten the pot. Guess who's back? Gordon! Alex? I don't believe it. How the hell did you get out of the Citadel? We're not exactly sure. All I know is the Vortigaunts had something to do with it. You guys know about the evacuation trains, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, we've been planning to make a push on the train station. Now it looks like we're gonna have to cut a path through every chicken ship Metrocop who's having second thoughts about defending City 17. Interesting graffiti here, though I cannot help but wonder where the artists got their supplies. And here we have a very inconvenient combat against a gunship in some kind of wooden barn, which is in the middle of the city for some goddamn reason. I bet the only reason this is here is because the devs wanted to showcase the barn being destroyed piece by piece to show off the source engine. It's tedious, not really fun. Maybe that's one of the reasons why the Source Engine is such a failure. To this day, only about 30 games use it, compared to over 700 for the Unreal Engine and almost 500 for Unity. Wow! That was... Jesus, Gordon, you're a real terror. Think it's dead? Maybe you should whack it with a crowbar, just in case. Hey, a hospital. Keep an eye out for medical supplies. So much for medical supplies. I found a shotgun. Well, better late than pregnant, but damn, there's been dozens of guns lying around since the beginning of the game. I wonder why you waited this much to grab one. Oh, and fun fact, this hospital is modeled after the hospital of Chernobyl. I mean, Pripyat, you know what I'm saying. I bet this was done to reinforce the Soviet feel of City 17. What's the plan? I'm sending folks out in groups. What the fuck? Before, if you can keep them safe and provide cover, we might actually stand a chance of reaching the escape trains. This is a terrible plan. What idiot put Barney in charge? Dr. Freeman. To think, all I used to want to do is sell insurance. That wasn't so hard. We should have brought everyone over at once. Yes! For fuck's sake, yes! This is exactly what we should have done! Double gun, huh? Okay. Oh, come on. Fucking man hacks. Really? You know what I realized? The Combine are terrible at artificial intelligence. They don't have any actually good robots. They don't have supercomputers. That's why they engineer synths. That's why they turn animals into sort of machines. Because they're using the animals' brains as computing power. This explains the existence of stalkers. I couldn't find the real reason why stalkers exist. Because I always thought everything they do, a robot could do better. 
I think one of the main reasons for the existence of stalkers is that the Combine cannot build a decent robot. And this explains a lot! Before, I could not understand why the Combine didn't just kill everyone after conquering the Earth. I was very puzzled by this. I could not see any reason why they didn't just kill every human being. I couldn't see any advantage for them in keeping us alive. When they arrived, they destroyed all of Earth's militaries in seven hours. But they left a lot of humans alive. It is more or less stated in the game that they didn't kill us thanks to Dr. Breen's negotiation skills. But I never really bought it. It doesn't make sense. Look at all what they need to keep us in line. All the cops, the soldiers, all the systems and infrastructures that are in place just to make the humans stay compliant and keep the resistance at bay. There's no way it's worth it to the Combine unless they really need us. And so I think that they do need us, or at least our brains. So because of that, among other things, I'm pretty convinced that the man hacks, as well as the scanners, are not combined engineering, but man-made. When I saw Ross Scott in Freeman's Mind called the man hacks redneck technology, I felt vindicated. It's really what they are, in my opinion. You know what they really remind me of? The Toclophane from Doctor Who. There's one episode where Earth gets invaded and taken over by the Toclophane, which are masquerading as some alien species from some faraway planet deep within the universe. But it is later revealed that the Toclophane are actually made and controlled by human beings. And actually, just like the Menhacks, the Toclafane are little flying drones with rotating blades. The more I think about it, the less I believe it's a coincidence. And despite the fact that they pretend to come from really far away, at the end of the episode it is revealed that they are from Earth and it's just human technology controlled by human beings. But the whole time it is unclear what they want, why did they conquer Earth, and why are they imposing their ruthless dictatorship over the whole planet. Even in context, it does not really make sense. So when they finally get asked the question, why did they do all this? Why all the murders? Why the dictatorship? Why, why did they do it? Well, the answer they give, and I believe it's very much in earnest, is that they did it because it's fun. There's no grand scheme. There's no complicated plan. They were just having fun. That's all. And I think the same applies to a lot of the combined force. In part one of the video, when the cop throws the can on the floor and tells you to put it in the trash can, when you comply he chuckles and I said remember that chuckle. Well, that was what I had in mind. I think a lot of the combined forces, maybe not the majority, but maybe, who knows, are doing it just for fun. After I considered all the possibilities, it's the only one, in my opinion, that 100% makes sense. I think a lot of it isn't some kind of complicated military strategy or some grand intergalactic plan. I think it's a form of sport. I think it's just some kind of entertainment. I really believe this is the most logical explanation to what the hell is going on. So yeah, the man hacks are most likely man-made. Keep your heads down. Hurry up, people. That was a close one. while you get the others away from here. We can grab another train once you're clear. Okay then. Don't take too long about it, yeah? Bye, Barney. Good luck. See you when I see you. And this is the last time Barney Calhoun was ever seen. No, seriously though, this is the last scene he appears in any Half-Life game. That is literally and still to this day the last time we saw him. And now the game is pulling another chip trick to artificially separate us from Alex because we have to be alone to fight the final boss for some reason. And that final boss is just one strider, but you're gonna fight it in the worst possible conditions. Basically, you cannot fight the strider unless you're in a very specific place in the end of the level. So you have to navigate the whole place while getting shot by the strider, but you cannot shoot back. And while you are navigating, 
you are going to be attacked by a lot of enemies. Now, said like that, this sounds good. This sounds good in theory. This sounds fun and challenging, but it's done in a really annoying way. A Strider has two attacks, small projectiles and big explosions, and both will actively modify the geography of the room you are in. So not only do you have to go through a fucking maze, but it's a maze that is changing and evolving as you are moving through it. So yeah, fuck this. Oh, and cherry on top of the shit cake, collision bugs, the collisions are not working properly, just in case this bullshit wasn't annoying enough. And of course, of course you're expecting some kind of huge payoff, some kind of epic final battle when you finally reach the point when you can fight against the Strider. <laughs> Look, this is what happens. This is as fun and exciting as washing the dishes. Fantastic job, Gordon! Oh, I don't believe it. I think we're actually gonna make it out of here. Here we go! We did it, Gordon! Transmission's going out. Combine advisors gratuitously mind blasting us, because why the fuck not? And so we get another cliffhanger ending, which at this point is par for the course. No need to dwell on it, let's go right to the next episode. Welcome to Half-Life 2, Episode 2. We are at the midpoint in our trilogy of episodes, which will conclude in Episode 3. Yet another good joke by our friend Gaben. As per usual, we start the game in a train. A train that looks pretty fucked up, but don't worry, our friendly neighborhood deus ex machina is coming to the rescue. Gordon? I'll get you out of there. Here, you take the gravity gun. You're better with it than I am. No, I'm really, really not. We should keep moving. I'm sure the Combine haven't forgotten about us. What if they have, though? It's a possibility that we shouldn't discard. What the hell is happening? all over again. How would you know? You were a toddler during the first days. Oh, look! Tunnels! Okay, a communication center. White Forest. White Forest, this is Alex Vance. Do you read? White Forest, come in. White Forest, are you there? Alex! My goodness! Is that really you? No, it's her twin sister. Come on, man. We made it out of City 17. Alex. Thank God! But something really strange is happening with the Citadel. It's the Combine. They're trying to open another gateway. Yes, what you're seeing is the infancy of a super portal. If it attains full strength, it'll be the Seven Hour War all over again. Except this time we won't last seven minutes. Won't last seven minutes, title of your sex tape. Dad? Dad, you're breaking up. Come in. Dad. Note Ellen McLean's new vocal style. I'm still not sure what the hell is going on with the whole combined teleportation thing. Apparently they can send stuff from Earth to their home planet, but they cannot come back? 
Does it work the same way with information? How do they communicate with their home world? Are they still using Zen as a relay? Or if they're really unable to send anything to Earth, what do they eat? Like, how is Earth food compatible with their systems? Are Are they even there at all? It's not 100% clear if any of them is actually on Earth. Maybe they just send their robots or slaves or something, and they're just like overseers from the other... Dem I don't fucking understand what's the deal. Like, the whole thing is that they're trying to open a super portal to come to Earth, but they're already on Earth? I, I don't follow. I don't understand. I try to wrap my head around it, but it doesn't make sense to me. The more I think about it and the more it seems to me that the only logical explanation is that the Combine do not exist. Like it's all a hoax and a conspiracy. Really, think about it. They could be just made up by some people, like Breen and whoever else would be his accomplices. A lot of stuff like the man hacks or the scanners are obviously robots that could have been built by humans probably have and the synth like the striders and the gunships etc they could have been made in a lab by some biologists who do like genetic experiments on animals like in deus ex everything could be earth fauna that has been modified the ant lions could be like genetically mutated insects the head crabs kind of look and act like chicken etc etc the only thing that is a, a obstacle that is a barrage to this theory is the vortigaunt this theory would not explain anything about the Vortigons. Apart from that, it, I think it's a solid theory. Uh, I, it really makes sense to me and it would explain so many things. So many things. Oh, and Alex is dead, by the way. Rest in peace, Alex. Let us hurry, Freeman. Help awaits us in the mine. In the mines, in the mines, where the sun does never shine. Oh, I gotta repair an elevator again? This is a joke, right? Ah, yes, the classic crowbar in the gears prank. Oldest trick in the book. So, the mines. It's what Half-Life does best. It's a bunch of tunnels. This level has actually three different kinds of tunnels. First, the mines themselves, tunnels that have been dug by human beings. Then, natural rock caves. And third, tunnels that have been dug by the ant lions. We are gonna dig deeper into ant lion territory. This, for example, is one of their grubs. The grubs are mostly harmless, and actually, if you step on one, it will release a nugget that will heal you and make your HP go back up, which is nice. But there are also ant lion workers, sometimes known as acid lions, and those are a real pain in the ass. Compared to the other ant lions, they're faster, they're smarter, they're more resistant, and they're more mobile. But the real kicker is that they can spit at you a neurotoxic acid that can hit you from afar and deal a lot of damage. And that will add a serious layer of difficulty to this level. So basically, we can't stay here. This is Ant Lion Country. And now we are about to meet Starsky and Hutch. Sorry, I mean Laurel and Hardy. Sorry, I mean Sheckley and Griggs, the comic relief duo of the game. You idiot. That's Gordon Freeman. The Vortigaunt said he was on the way. Dr. Freeman, Alex Vance is over here. Freeman. It is well. Alex Vance clings to the margins. The margins of what? You can clearly see she's not breathing. Get over it, man. Must not be disturbed. Yeah, well, about that. As long as you're down here, Freeman, maybe you can give us a hand. Let me show you how the antlion sensors work. This sensor will light up if an antlion's coming down this tunnel. More lights mean more antlions. When a tunnel lights up, we move a few turrets in front of it. Pretty simple, eh, Doc? Hey, Doc! On your way here, you weren't followed, were you? Don, listen to him, Doc. We're on edge because this place is riddled with antlions. The Vort says as long as we don't step on their grubs, they shouldn't hear us this far from the nest. Uh-oh. One light! 
Let's move. We have to defend the fort. So here we have another sequence of attrition warfare. You're stuck defending the Vortigant medic while being repeatedly assaulted by waves of end lines. No offense, Freeman. But things were pretty quiet until you showed up. It's actually surprisingly easy compared to the fight in Nova Prospect. If you listen to what the squad is saying and place your turrets correctly, you barely have a fight at all. Plus, you've got two crates of infinite ammo, one for your shotgun, the other for your machine gun, and you never really get bored because Shickley and Griggs keep providing colorful commentary. So in the end, this is pretty good. We can really see Valve learning from their past mistakes. I got ten! Yeah, well, we all got ten. There's hundreds of them. Hey, Doc, you cover the breach. There are twelve. We got twenty-four. What was wrong with that hole? What was wrong with that hole? Tell it off your sex tape. There can't be many more. What the hell makes you think that? I mean, you are boxed in and the action is repetitive, but somehow it kind of works. And even if this battle feels a little unnecessary, I don't hate it. It's okay. I'm okay with it. Last turret just broke. Three lights. We got three lights. Why are there so many? I think we misunderestimated. Look alive. Welcome to the middle of the video. My name is Dr. Pat Stewart, and I'm going to be answering some questions about some of the science seen in the Half-Life games. I'm actually a professional chemist by trade, and my specialty is physical organic chemistry, which is basically understanding how and why chemical reactions work for organic molecules. First thing we're going to cover what the lambda symbol associated with half-life means. So in order to do this, let's just recap on what is inside of an atom. So we have electrons, negatively charged particles, that are bound to a nucleus, which consists of protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which are neutral. The number of protons within the nucleus determines what the element is. The number of neutrons can vary. So you have carbon 12, 13, 14. They've all got the same number of protons, but the number of neutrons can vary. We call these isotopes. Now, some of these isotopes are stable and will remain as they are in the absence of any external stimulus, but some are unstable and they will decay by radiation to a state which is more stable. And what this does is it results in the radioactive substance, the isotope, converting into another substance. Now, this could be a substance of the same element, if the proton count remains the same, or it could be a different element. And we call this process transmutation. Now, each transmutation event, so the conversion of a radioactive atom into a more stable product via radioactive decay, is random. So, you can't just point at one atom and say he's going to go in five, four, three. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. But what you can do is take a population of atoms and have a look at the average decay rate. Here's how we do that. Let's think about N as the number of atoms there are in a sample of radioactive material. And T is time. So if I picked up a lump of radioactive material that is decaying, and I picked up and I said, start timing. The number of atoms that are still radioactive in that substance would be N, zero, as soon as I picked it up, because as soon as I started timing, that would be T zero. So imagine you walked into a kitchen and in the kitchen there was a pan of popcorn on the hob and you walked in and it was popping frequently, you know, it was full heat. What you'd notice is that if it was popping madly, over time, the number of pops would slow down. You'd hear fewer of them. And that's because the rate of pops, so dn by dt, so let's say n is unpopped popcorn kernels by dt, it slows down because there are fewer kernels left to pop. Now we can use this for atoms, right? You know, you can't unpop a popcorn kernel. So we can say that dn by dt, the rate at which atoms decay 
is going to be proportional to the number of atoms left. And that means we can turn this proportional relationship here into an equation by bringing in a constant. And in this case, we use the decay constant, lambda. So the rate of decay minus dn by dt equals lambda times the number of atoms left to decay. The rate of decay is proportional to the number of atoms left. That means the more atoms there are left, the faster the rate will be. We can also write this as the rate equals the amount of atoms times by a constant. And in this instance, we write the constant as lambda, and this is the decay constant. And what this is, is a measure of how quickly a radioactive isotope will decay. I'm not going to go into the maths here because it'll take too long, but if you've got any questions, just send Nelson a DM and uh, he'll send you in my direction. So in this graph, you can see that the number of nuclei remaining, which is on the y-axis, decreases as time goes on, but you can see it's a, a very smooth curve. What's interesting about this and what's characteristic about this is that if you follow the little dotted lines, you'll see that the number of nuclei remaining keeps halving and it keeps halving after a set duration. So here's another graph. As you can see, much like lithium-8, you've got this smooth decay curve. And if you follow the dotted lines on this one, you'll see that again, after a fixed duration, the amount of atoms remaining is halving. In this case, the time it takes for the number of atoms to half is 30.2 years. Now this is actually a very simplified form of the decay of this, it's actually a bit more complex. But for this example, works perfectly. What you can see from this is that lithium-8 goes really quickly, disappears very fast. Cesium-137 hangs about, but they both decay in a very, very similar way. You get these smooth curves and they both keep halving after a set period. The amount of time it takes for the number of atoms remaining in a radioactive substance to half is called the half-life. And this is characteristic for a certain isotope. So, for example, we saw that cesium-137 and lithium-8 have got very different half-lives. We can express this as the half-life equals 0.69 divided by the decay constant. More at lions approach. We shall quiet them. This is the point in the game where I'm really glad that there is no friendly fire, because things are about to get hectic. Exhausted their immediate number. Now to the next matter of urgency. The Alex fans. Their injuries are grave. This will necessitate deep submersion in the Vortessian seed. We require the larval extract. Oh, yes. The extract. The extract. Yes. Agui. I will make the journey to seek the extract deep within the nest, in the sacred nectarium. But I cannot hope to bring it back home. We must remain to keep the Alex Vance alive. Please, Freeman, join me. Yes, Kate, yes. Freeman. There is no final companion. Well stated. So, in case you missed any of that, we're about to play Wingman to a Vortigaunt in search of Antlion Royal Jelly. Because apparently it's the only ingredient that could resuscitate, or rather, resurrect, the Alex Vans. Um, did someone say contrived? <laughs> yeah. 
the sad fate of these others is our good fortune. Man, Vortigan philosophy is so deep. Quite fitting, actually, since we're in a mine. Pity the generator that requires a Vortigan to buy. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, you can do it! Ha! Strike! So you have summoned the lift! Yeah, because apparently that's my job now. If there's an elevator, apparently I'm in charge of it. That MIT education really pays for itself. I have the situation well in hand. That lift is too small to hold us both. Go on alone. I will join you when I can. Uh, what is this? Titanic? There is more than enough space on that lift for us both. poignant scene, an eternity's repose. It brings peaceful thoughts, does it not? I swear to god, everyone in this fucking game is a psycho. The stuff we seek lies at the bottom of this pit. This shaft connects to the chamber above, where my kin sustain the Alexans. Once we have the extract, we can rejoin them quickly, provided we can restore elevator function. Oh, I have to repair an elevator again? For fuck's sake. Hey, I was talking about Lara Croft earlier, and here we have a very Tomb Raider style puzzle where you have to find a gear to repair a mechanism. I think every Tomb Raider game is contractually obliged to have at least one of these per level. This is new though. I descend. <laughs> I thought this looked so good the first time I saw it. Surprisingly, contrary to the rest of the game, this hasn't aged well. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's that fucking bloom that they smeared all over. Ah, excellent. A bounty of Largo Expand. Let us return now to the Alexpans. Largo calls her hands. Stop, she ebbs. If we lose her, we lose all. Why? This is never explained. Oh wait, I'm reminded now of another game where an evil scientist turns animals into robotic slaves in order to conquer the world. And if you want to defeat him and see the true ending of the game, there's a... you need to... Alex and Eli are the Chaos Emeralds! Ah! Behold the extra yes. Secretion. Miraculous secretion, title of your sex tape. As we imbibe the extra. Yeah. Hey, does that mean that all the Vortigans are knuckles? I really like the 3D effect here. Reminds me of the Matrix Reloaded. Dr. Freeman. Oh shit! I realize this moment may not be the most convenient for a heart-to-heart, -heart, but I had to wait until your friends were otherwise occupied. 
There was a time they cared nothing for Miss Vance, when their only experience of humanity was a crowbar coming at them down a steel corridor. This line has always confused me. Black Mesa is an underground scientific complex. It's made of concrete. Most of the corridors in Black Mesa are concrete. Why is it saying steel? Maybe it's a specific reference I'm missing, but that steel corridor line doesn't really make sense to me. I have learned to ignore such naysayers when quelling them was out of the question. You know, Valve said that they created the G-Men because they wanted a character, an important character, that you couldn't tell if he was good or evil, and you couldn't tell if he was on your side or not. Well, as far as I'm concerned, mission accomplished. I, I must now extract from you some small repayment owed for your own survival. See her safely to White Forest, Dr. Freeman. That was already the plan. You didn't have to ask. You, but I have agreed to abide by certain restrictions. Well, now listen carefully, my dear. When you see your father, relay these words. Prepare for unforeseen consequences. Sisters. The vital form has regained integrity. We have a very immeasurable oh. loss. Oh, God. Lie oh. still. Oh. Oh, my God. I thought... I thought for sure I was dead. You were. The Combine Hunters caused traumatic injury. A hunter. So that's what it was. I will get you on the path to White Forest. Come on, Gordon. Next to me. Continue our hunt for advisors. Farewell. Go safely. Travel well. Good luck out there. Okay, Freeman. Be adequate. This boss battle is fun, except when the acid lions show up, but they are in limited quantity. I like how, after saying this line, she immediately sits down. Yeah, I got the message, bitch. Puzzling. The sentries should have spotted us by now. You think the Combine found them? Such a theory is hardly far-fetched. Oh, God. The Combine found them, all right but came to no good end themselves. Head crabs have had their way with both parties. Hey, look, out on that bridge. I think I see the car you were talking about. Well, if they got it over there, maybe we can jump it back to this side. 
We recommend the Freeman for this task. Hey, I'm feeling a lot better. That condition will not last long if you plunge into the toxins below. We would do well to lend our protection from above while Freeman skirts the hazards in the pit. Good luck, Gordon. Oh, hey, a valve! Here we have the repetition of an early puzzle from Half-Life 2, but in reverse. And here we have Alex supporting you from above with a sniper rifle. Never seen this one before. There you are. And here we have a Ravenholm style fire puzzle thing. And, uh, is this what I think it is? Wow. This game is such a best of, this game is such a best of, na 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 na. Except my Geiger counter is clicking, so it's not just Ravenholm, it's radioactive Ravenholm. Damn. Fork lift, fork lift, fork lift, fork lift! And here we have the return of the radioactive swamp that will not hurt you if you stand right in front of it, but will do a lot of damage if you set foot in it. Hey Pat, what do you think about this? Realistic or retarded? So let's consider these radioactive hazards. You've got the radiation itself, so your alpha, beta, gamma, for example, given off by radioactive sources. And you've got the radioactive sources themselves, ions that are radioactive that could be dissolved within the water. So there's two kind of suits that you can think of to stop radiation. There is a complete barrier suit, you know, one of the big hazmat suits that you see in films, like an ET, when the blokes come in and whatever, I can't remember. But you've got the big suits that often have the self-contained breathing apparatus inside them. And you also have suits that have a adsorbent layer on them, which is there to take in things from the air. And these aren't as effective, but they're breathable, which means that if you're very active, it stops you from overheating. So what I think happens here is that Gordon Freeman's suit is of the second type. It's breathable, it's got an adsorbent layer on it, and that makes sense because if he was wearing a full hazmat suit, he'd probably start overheating very quickly. Any kind of cooling mechanisms would add extra weight to it, he'd get tired out. And, you know, he's very active in the game, you know, when he with the crowbar and the small thing, and it, yeah, he's, he does quite a lot. He gets a lot done. So what I think happens is that he's got a suit that's designed to stop radiation in the air. But as soon as he gets in the water, it completely knackers the adsorbent layer and it all just floods in because the suit's not designed for that. Huh. Guess what they're doing? This is a redux of the seesaw puzzle from the beginning of Half-Life 2. Except this time, instead of moving cinder blocks on a planche, you are going to be moving whole ass cars on a portion of bridge. It's the same stupid concept though, it's just an annoying pseudo puzzle and it's just meant to show off the physics of the source engine. Hey developers, here's a hint. If you want to show off your engine, here's an example on how to do it right. Breakable tiles. On demand water flow. Interactive decor. This stuff was pretty cutting edge in 2001, but do you see how it does not get in the way and just complements the gameplay instead? It's good stuff, it's fun, and it makes the game more realistic and immersive. But more importantly, it doesn't stop you in your tracks and forces you to complete a bad puzzle in order to experience it. And I think that makes a huge difference. 
Valve forcing us to do a physics puzzle kinda remind me how for a time you had to have a Google Plus account in order to be able to comment on YouTube. If you want to put cool physics shit in your game, I'm all for it. But just give us the choice of using it or not. Don't turn it into a literal chore. Anyway, back to Half-Life 2 Episode 2. This is when I regret that the game was not released a few years earlier, because in the late 90s, early 2000s, the car doing a jump on that bridge would have made a killer slow motion cutscene. Instead, there it feels quite underwhelming. Fortunately, Alex's reaction makes up for it. Look at this car. We scored. Oh, I thought it was a piece of junk, but Shotgun. you're the expert. I will never understand cars. And here you see the Source engine absolutely shitting itself. The LOD rendering is completely fucked and the draw distance is abysmal. Why not giving us the option to change the draw distance in the video settings? The Source engine had support for 4K and ultra wide all the way back in 2004, but they didn't foresee that GPUs in the future could have more VRAM? Maybe it's an engine limitation, maybe I'm missing something, I don't know. Nobody's home. Wonder how long it's been deserted. They must have a transmitter in one of these buildings. Well, here's the transmitter. Mm, no power, though. Let's see if we can get some electricity going. Okay, power's on up here. Gordon, hide. Hunters, they're out there. can really sense the fear and anger in her voice. Don't worry, sis, we'll fuck him up. You will get your revenge. We should get our warning out and then keep moving. That was probably a scouting party. Well, these scouts know how to party! Come in. White Forest, do you read? White Forest, do you read? This is White Forest. Identify yourself. This is Alex. Alex? Alex Vance? Where are you? I expected you hours ago. Well, we had a bit of a set. Don't you understand the gravity of the situation? The survival of Earth depends on the data you yes, carry. Yes, I know. But the Combine, they're heading your way. What? What's that? What? You're heading our way? Well, I should hope so. Not what? us. What was that? Combine. You You're breaking up, ready. Alex. What? What? Crap. Look. It's one of those advisor pods. Back in the Citadel, those things we saw. What was that? There it is again. 
You gotta love Alex Vance. We just experienced an incredible supernatural force, so powerful it can bend reality and distort the colors of the world around us. So what does she do? She whips out her little pistol. We have no fucking idea what's going on, but one thing's for sure, Cthulhu is about to get shot. Doom guy would approve, so I guess it's all that matters. Shall we pull the plug? In case this is an obvious, we are paralyzed during this sequence. You can't grab your gun, you can't move at all. He's going all Yuri Geller on us. There's a theory saying that with this appendage, he's not just sucking your brains out, but absorbing all the memories and knowledge inside. Maybe that's why he seems so interested in Gordon afterwards. And just before he can caprice on our brains, our friendly neighborhood Deus Ex Machina strikes again. The thing was hurt, did you see it? I can only imagine what it would have done if... Uh-oh. Autonomous units subsumed. Sounds like it called its friends. Soldiers! Get pumpkined, bitch! This sequence here is fucking great. It's a remix of the airboat helicopter section from the OG Half-Life 2, but what makes this part amazing is that the worse your driving is, the more enthusiastic Alex gets. Gordon. Simply delightful. Shooting the zombie is not cool enough. Kick him in the face. Oh crap! We may have to ditch the car. Hey! In here! This way. Since you brought that chopper in on your tail, you want to maybe help us take it down? Oh, with pleasure. This is such a Booker catch moment, which is funny because Elizabeth from Bioshock is also a NPC that spends a lot of time with you, but that escorts you rather than you escorting her. And she's also the daughter of one of the main characters. There's a lot of parallels between Bioshock and Half-Life when you think about it. For example, the first one is set under the sea, while Black Mesa is underground, and it's about a bunch of libertarian scientists with too much power and not enough ethics, and maybe some supernatural aid who basically fucked around and found out. Amazing. The way you threw their minds right back at them. Well, I could sure use a drink. Who's with me? We need to get back on the road, but our engine shot to hell. I don't suppose you got any tools for working on cars. Tools? <laughs> got a whole shop over here. Come on, we'll get you set up. I give the Combine a lot of credit, though. They're tough competitors. A real class act. Shut up. <laughs> 
You weren't kidding. We'll be back on the road in no time. Hey, don't worry about us. See this car? We're fixing it up and getting the hell out of here. Driving to Hawaii. Beaches, babes, and waves. Tell you what, if you ever get sick of this rebel crap, you know who to talk to. So, uh, is that your boyfriend? Of course, the most damning parallel between the first Half-Life and the first Bioshock is the fact that they both feature a weapon that shoots bees, which is not exactly something common and banal that you'll find in every other game. And in Bioshock 2, Rapture is being oppressed by a communist-style regime, very similar to the one of the Combine. Half-Life itself has a lot of references, of course, the most obvious one being Stephen King's The Mist, but it's generally more subtle. For example, you might know that the game that inspired Half-Life is quite different from the finished product. According to Gabe Newell himself, the main inspiration for creating Half-Life was a game that I will not dare say the name out loud because the company that developed and published it is very aggressive with its copyright policy, so I'm just gonna call it Plumber's Game. Hmm? Plumber's Game 8 Squared, more specifically. And interestingly, the creator of Plumber Game was himself inspired to start making video games because of a game called Space Invaders, which, just like Half-Life, is about a lonesome hero trying to fight hordes of invading aliens with just one little gun. Now pay attention, because here we have the best puzzle of the game. And it actually might be the best puzzle of the whole Half-Life franchise. A weapons cache that can only be accessed by the top, a metal floor that is on hinges, and a crate of grenades. Hmm... Hell yeah! Rocket launcher. That'll come in handy. <laughs> hey, let's keep looping the reference loop. Half-Life was both directly and indirectly inspired by Space Invaders, a video came from 1978. Space Invaders was inspired by The War of the Worlds, a science fiction novel by author H.G. Wells from 1898. War of the Worlds was inspired by The Battle of Dorking, a novel by George Tompkins Chesney from 1871. Story about angry Germans conquering Britain by surprise. The Battle of Dorking was inspired by the real events of the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Some of the events linked to the Franco-Prussian War inspired 93, the last novel by French author Victor Hugo. And 93 was one of the main inspirations for Russian-American philosopher Ayn Rand, who is the author of Atlas Shrugged, her fourth and final novel from 1957. And as you probably know, Atlas Shrugged was one of the main inspirations for the video game Bioshock, which is also largely inspired by Half-Life. We loop the loop. It's a trap. Gordon, come on. I like how Alex keeps complimenting our marksmanship, even when we are getting ass blasted by the combine from every possible corner. That girl's got her priorities straight. It's too much title over your six more. tape. Down below! Over there! I see an antenna. Huh, I think that's 
white forest. And our friendly neighborhood Deus Ex Machina strikes again, this time under the form of Dog. <sighs> dog. Okay, I didn't want to rant about it, but come on, there's something that grinds my gear just a little bit about Dog. It's a robot that is very mobile, it can run fast. It's also very, very strong. In CD17, we saw him throw a car like if it was a beach ball. And it's also really smart. It has an AI that can process human speech very effectively. So, uh, could a robot like that be built? Yes, of course. And it would have a battery life of 30 minutes tops. Seriously, am I the only one that's bothered by this? Where's the fuel? D does he have a nuclear power plant in his ass? It's a bit crazy to me that we never see these addressed. Would I go as far as to call it a plot hole? Uh, yeah, kinda. It's not as bullshitty as young British aristocrat who spent a decade studying archaeology can fire accurately at two moving targets while doing acrobatic jumps, but it's pretty close. That doesn't change the fact that it's a cool and fun and cute character and I love him, but I would like to have some closure about the energy source that powers this lovable mutt. Safe at last. You smell that? It's freedom. Alex! Dr. Freeman, you made it! So, have you ever used an AR-2 before? AR-2? No. Now, an AR-3, sure. Plenty of times. There is no such thing as an AR-3. <laughs> well, see, in the city, the place was lousy with AR-3s. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. No, it was. So do you know what the alternative fire method does on the AR-2? It kills hunters. How did you city folk kill hunters? We sure as hell didn't use guns. We would just wrestle hunters to the ground with our bare hands. I used to kill 10, 20 a day, just using my fists. Also, when you're out in the field, you're gonna be punching hunters? In the field? I'm not going out in the field. I'm a radio operator. I was so afraid I wouldn't see you again. There, there, sweetheart. We're together now. My dear, what a relief. Not to mention a delight to see you here at last. And Gordon, I see you in the HEV suit have taken excellent care of each other. <laughs> They're inseparable. The data, people, the data! Kleiner, are you going to sync up the satellite, or should I postpone the launch to make time for a family reunion? All right, all right. All right. I was just saying hello to Alex and Gordon. Oh, fine. No one grants me a moment's peace, but by all means, unroll the red car. I love Dr. Magnuson. ...that you've been carrying. If I delay a single moment, I'll never hear the end of it. You have my word on it. It's right here, Dr. Kleiner. We've got a ton of data. The strange thing is, it was all attached to a transmission from Judith. Transmission? From Judith? Oh yeah, talking about Judith, this reminds me. Pat, was there ever a place of employment where you worked at where not a single scientist was a woman? I've worked at a number of large labs and research facilities, and all of them have had female employees. False alarms all day. Damn crows have been nesting in the tracks. I do not know how I am supposed to concentrate with all of this racket. Freeman, Freeman, you're not doing anything. Make yourself useful and find out what the hell is going on in there. Uh, yes. Gordon, if you don't mind, I'd feel better if you had a look. Catch up with us when you're done. Elevator moment. At least this time I don't have to fix it. But I'm still doing maintenance. You know, the great Kurt Vonnegut once said that one of the biggest flaws in the human character is that everybody wants to build, but nobody wants to do maintenance. Maybe that's what Half-Life is all about. Gordon Freeman, Maintenance Man of the Universe. Freeman! The Magnuson has instructed me to admit you into the secondary silo. Now, let's investigate this false alarm. Magnuson must have said oh shit, it's a real alarm! Fuck! <laughs> Fucking man hacks? Really? Ugh, 
one of my best shots, and Alex isn't even there to compliment it. What's the point? Oh, I hate when they do this. I mean, it's great AI, but it's cramping my style. This might be a reference to the scientist who urges you to open the silo doors in the first Half-Life. There's something else here. <gasps> it's the Borealis. Good God. Incredible. What? The Borealis? It's real? Oh, yes, quite real, despite its almost legendary stature. Few believed the Borealis would ever be seen again. It should have been lost forever. Ah, but now that we've found it, we can use it against the Combine. Did you use it? That thing has to be destroyed. But think of the advantage for humanity. We can't simply waste all that potential. Black Mesa taught you anything? There's no controlling that kind of power. Well, yes, there's always a risk, Eli. But my goodness, we have coordinates, blueprints, hailing frequencies. Quite ingenious of Dr. Mossman to hide it all in the carrier way. Well, that means she's still alive up there. I'm going after Dad! Her. Now, Eli, the only thing worse than Judith falling into their hands would be if they should get a hold of you. She may know the particulars of the Borealis, but you, you know everything about the Resistance. Uh, the Resistance is just volts divided by amps. Even I know that. It's not exactly rocket science. No, I can't. I can't. Dad, prepare for unforeseen consequences. What did you say? Dad, okay, it's okay, just, just lean into me. Let's get you off your feet. Thank you, baby. I'll be fine in a minute or two. Okay, do you need anything? Actually, Alex, would you, would you mind getting me a cup of tea? There's a hot plate in the old staff room. I'll be right back. Gordon, did you keep an eye on him? We're, we're not going anywhere. Thank you, baby. Unforeseen consequences. <laughs> the last time I heard those words was back at Black Mesa. You had just stepped into the test chamber when he whispered them in my ear. You know who I'm talking about. Our mutual friend. When he brought in that crystal, I knew I... I should have aborted that damn test, but I didn't. The whole world went to hell that day. And now, now he's using my little girl, putting words in her mouth. God damn it. I should have known when he rescued her, it was for his own damn reasons. Gordon, there's so much I need to tell you. Between us, we may finally have a chance of, um... Here you go. Is everything all right? There's nothing, honey. All right, people, change of plans. There is no way we can launch before those striders are... Oh. Oh, excuse me if I'm interrupting tea time. I'll just step out until you've finished, if that's more convenient. It's all right, honey. 
and now it is time for the final boss battle. Remember how the final boss of episode 1 was a Strider? Well here the final boss is an army of Striders, there's a lot of them, and they are escorted by packs of hunters. Thankfully you have sticky bombs invented by Magnuson to aid you in your task, and also a lot of resistance fighters will support your effort. So in the end it, it evens out and uh, you get to fly a helicopter, of course it has to end in a vehicle, right? Well, helicopter time. But uh, 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 first, there's something to be done. At this point, the game treats it like a mere formality, but it was the whole point of the episodes. In case you didn't follow, using the data that Alex stole at the Citadel in the beginning of episode 1, Magnussen, aided by Kleiner and Eli, have prepared a rocket ship that will emit some kind of wave that will counter the beam of portal energy that the Combine have made using the Citadel's meltdown, and so that rocket will prevent the Combine from opening a new portal, which is huge! If the rocket fails, humanity is doomed. If the rocket succeeds, there is hope. That rocket and the portal jammer it contains is the biggest counterattack of humanity against the Combine since they first invaded. It is, it is huge. But don't let that distract you from the upcoming helicopter flight. Thanks, Freeman. Ah, Freeman. Well, I see the Magnuson device performed flawlessly. I feel compelled to thank you personally for saving my rocket. So, um, thank you. <clears throat> well, that's enough chit chat. I've got a rocket to launch. Wow. For a minute there, I thought you were going to get a hug. Powered and rest switched over to internal power. Naturally, some time ago. And armed? Of course. Don't ever say of course. We can't take anything for granted. No, of course not. <sighs> Three, two, one. And not a moment too soon. Your mother would be so proud. Dad. Dr. Kleiner gave us the Borealis coordinates. We'll keep the hailing frequency open on the chopper radio in case Judith tries to reach us again. Good idea. She could well make another attempt. Oh no. Dad! Gordon! Now that's a fucking cliffhanger. 
to be continued in Half-Life 2 Episode 3, planned for a release in 2008. Things didn't go quite as planned. We got interviews, release dates, concept art, screenshots, empty promise after empty promise, and false hope after false hope, while the game was slowly turning into vaporware. The name Half-Life 3 became a joke synonymous with a game that will never be released, while the majority of the community became firmly planted in the denial stage of the Kubler-Ross model. Meanwhile, Half-Life 2 Episode 4 was being developed by the small French art house Arcane, which at the time was a very tiny developer, but that studio would later release cult classics such as Dishonored and Prey. Half-Life 2 Episode 4's working name was Return to Ra Ravenholm. The protagonist was said to be Adrian Shepard, the main character from Opposing Force, and the game would revolve around the character of Father Grigori, especially around how he resisted against the zombies and the headcrabs, and how his inventions provided electricity for the whole town of Ravenholm. A lot of the game revolved around electricity in general, and it was to feature a lot of electricity-based puzzles. That game was cancelled by Valve after one year in development. At that time it was about 50% finished. The game's original writer, Mark Laidlaw, quit Valve in January of 2016. Two years later, he posted on his blog a thinly veiled interpretation of what was to be the scenario of episode 3. I've read it, so you don't have to, and I think he was just trolling, because, uh, well, here's a summary of the letter. Alex and Gordon depart together to go find Judith. When they meet her, she explains that the Borealis actually travels through space and time continually, and that's why no one was ever able to find it because it exists at different points in time and space and parallel universes and keeps switching between these points. Uh, what? But they find it because they have the coordinates. I, so they, they, they find it, that's the point. When they go on the Borealis, Alex wants to fulfill the wish of her dead father and destroy the ship. Judith is completely opposed to that. She wants to use the ship against the Combine. The argument escalates so much that Alex kills Judith. What? And so Gordon decides to go on the ship alone and uh, he finds the homeworld of the Combine. And when he is there, when he sees how powerful they really are and the amount of space that they control, he becomes overwhelmed. And so Gordon Freeman decides to give up. What? Everyone thought that this was the final nail in the coffin, but a little more than two years ago, near the end of 2019, completely out of the blue, we got a trailer. Alex? Alex! I'm here. So what's the plan? This took everyone by surprise, to say the least. And now people say it's one of the best VR games ever made. Yeah, it's a VR exclusive, so I haven't played it yet. I'm waiting for VR technology to be good and affordable, which seems to be right around the corner. After all, the first time I played Half-Life 2 was in 2014, 10 years after its release. I'm used to playing video games late. It's not an issue for me, especially since I don't care about spoilers. I will play it eventually, and that will make for a great follow-up episode. So yeah, I am definitely going to talk again about Half-Life in the future. There's actually so many things I wanted to include in this video that I had to cut for several reasons. I wanted especially to do a deep dive on the design of Half-Life. Character designs, building designs, enemy design, etc. I also want to talk about Opposing Force and Blue Shift and Decay. And I also have more science questions to ask, so... To be continued, there will be a part 3, but 
don't hold your breath because that's not gonna be soon. So right now I don't have much more to say except for thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, leave a comment and share it as much as possible. If you really like the video, consider subscribing to my Patreon so I can make many more videos like this in optimal conditions and Mojito's gaming bar will come back soon. Next episode will be about a post-apocalyptic game where you play as a mutant. See ya! Welcome to the middle of the video. My name is Dr. Pat Stewart and I'm going to be answering some of the questions about the science seen in... No, some of the... Hello and welcome to the middle of the video. No, that's dog shit.